Hello and welcome to the Comedians Outlook podcast. I'm Luke Anthony and this week I'm joined by Preet Singh. He's been on the circuit for about 18 months but has been in and amongst comedy for a lot longer than that. I really enjoyed this conversation with him. It was very interesting to get into his mind and about his world of comedy so I really hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So Preet, how did you first get into comedy? I guess my first ever, ever open mic was at uni. Uh, it was, I was in my final year or my third year or something. Uh, people at university used to tell me I was funny or like tell like little jokes and stuff. All, I've always been into comedy uh, since I was like 13. Used to love stand up. Like when YouTube became a thing, the first comedy clip I ever saw was um, Dave Chappelle out of Killing Him Softly on yeah. YouTube. It was like a five minute clip about his Sesame th- Street thing. So I always had it in, in in the back of my mind that I lo- you know I love this thing like stand up comedy is like just great. Um, so people at university started telling me, oh, you know, you're funny. Um, and I don't think anybody actually said do stand up, but my own narcissism was like, <laughs> I should do stand up. <laughs> so, um, I picked it up. I wrote like, I wrote, this is actually quite a funny story actually. So I wrote down a few jokes, uh, in inverted commas because they're not really jokes anymore. <laughs> it was okay. just like ramblings. And, um, took it to an open mic over down towards Ickenham Way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, went there, signed up at the bar. First got so I'm on second. Tell him it's my first time and everything. They're like, yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, first guy gets on, does a song. I'm standing there. And I'm thinking this is not funny at all. Like, what the hell? He got way too into it. Where, where's the punchlines? And in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I'm gonna kill this. Wait till they hear my stuff. I get on, and this is generally true. There's eight people in the audience, and 25 percent of the audience is dogs. Yeah, there were two dogs <laughs> in the audience, and um, so I do my five minute thing. People look confused. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? Like, what, what's going on? And I get off the stage. The next person gets on, does a song. I'd gone on to a music open mic night. Okay, yeah, that's why. That's how I started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they didn't tell me. No, they didn't tell me anything. So I went off, and it went so bad. I just didn't, didn't do anything. Carried on telling people I was a comedian. Like yeah. it was in my Tinder bio and everything. But then about eighteen months later, uh, no, sorry, eighteen months ago. Yeah, I was sat at my desk and I was thinking, this life is just shit at work. I was like, this is just awful. So I was like, okay, let me let me pick up stand up again. Yeah. Started doing it, what, once? Once every like couple of months I've gone. No, once every few weeks, I'd say. And then in August, like I, I, over the summer, I did this like gig and it went really well. And I was like, oh, shit. I should like probably actually start putting in some effort. So I started writing jokes, started doing everything. And since August, I've been doing uh, anywhere from about three to eight, nine times a week. Mm. Um, it's really been going well, like last, especially the last like month or so. It's just really like picked up, which has been great. Um so just come back from Berlin, did a few nights out there. Um, How did you find that? Did you find the Germans all right? I had Dom on oh. who's been over at Germany as yeah. well. So. Oh, it was awesome. So I only had the, the the spots on the nights. I didn't have like mm. my own show or anything yeah. yet. Um, but it was awesome. Like the crowd was so switched on, real international vibe. They treat, shout outs to Cosmic Comedy as well. That was one of the promotions I did it to, um, went to. They like treat you so well. Um, they really line up and the MCs and stuff. There's a lot of talent out there as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just awesome. Like the whole experience was great. Um, I figured out after my first one that you have to like be a little bit slower. The rhythms and stuff are different with your punchlines. Um, you have to also speak clearly. <laughs> yeah, imagine, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but great, absolutely great experience. Would definitely travel again. So have you, have you traveled to anywhere, anywhere other than, I mean, so you've done, you've done Reading and yeah, obviously. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a couple of nights in Reading, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of um, uh, Reading Union Society does it. There's um, there's a new one as well uh, from from Nick. Uh, it's called Mates Comedy or something, I think. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, there's r- really a few nights developing out there. Yeah, uh, and obviously London is is like the Holy Grail at the moment. It's, you, you can you can get you can get a lot of shit gigs. That's the only thing with London yeah. gigs. But you 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 can get good pretty quick. Yeah. yeah, well, you know that old adage that you're never three feet away from a rat or you're never three feet away from an open mic in London. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's so much in the, the... There's a lot of exciting talent out there as well. It's Absolutely. It's just a very saturated market. That's the, that's the only thing. Yeah. It's but if the, you are good, you will get paid, I think, eventually. Yeah, 100%. You just have to like keep keep at it and stuff. And I think, um, I think I got into that spot where I was really like, okay, I need to start getting paid now. You know, I've had like three good three good gigs like i need to get paid i need to do this i need to do that um but then some of the more experienced acts was just like man just like have fun and i was yeah. like damn that's like it was a simple sentence like that really makes you shift your mindset and um that's exactly what happened like since i since i was like okay let me actually try and be a good comedian rather than try and 
like just rush my way through it. Um, since then, my writing and stuff's gone gone up a level. I think uh, the risks and stuff I take on stage as well, getting up there. Um, but yeah, so just have fun, I guess. Uh, like that's been my favourite thing to come out of it. So you're not you're not in a rush anymore to start getting paid for gigs. Obviously, we all want to be paid for it, so we can do it as a living. But you know, it's it's good it's good that you've, you've changed your mindset and you're just going to do it for the love of it. And if it reaps rewards, then then brilliant. Yeah, exactly. Like I think life is so like like normal day everyday life is, can be so serious. Yeah. Where you're like, oh, okay, I've got to do this to get a promotion. I've got to do this to do that. Um, but here you've got something that could literally just be fun. And then as you progress and get better and better, you're gonna. It, it's it's kind of like I, I do it a lot. So I used to work out a lot and stuff, and I kind of like link it back to that. Yeah. Where it's like yeah. you don't get paid to go to the gym, no. but you like do it because you you like lo- you like it. You play five aside because you like it do that and if you've got the talent you'll eventually make it as like now like the more risks and stuff I take and the the more fun I have with it the more like rewards you reap I guess yeah definitely definitely so are you, are you were you born and raised in in England yeah so I, um, I'm a second generation immigrant so uh, my parents came over in the late 70s um, settled in Reading we've got quite quite a bit of family and stuff in Reading Reading has quite diverse field yeah i've got family out there yeah Yeah, so like a lot of um i know like quite a few people from different backgrounds and stuff so it was it it was almost a melting pot to some extent um but yeah so born and raised breading went to uni in london um and yeah that's been me so i think um i'm very i'm very much a product of two worlds the Mm -hmm. brown world and the white world (laughs) right so so where where were your parents originally from Parents were from Punjab in North India. Yeah. Uh, borders onto Pakistan. Um, they moved that my mum's granddad moved, uh, no, my mum's dad, sorry, my granddad moved over here in the seventies. Um, right. economic, for, for economic reasons. Um, and they settled out here since. That and for the benefits. Yeah. <laughs> no. um, free healthcare. Yeah. So they settled out, they, they settled down over here and, you know, thankfully you know family's doing well and stuff prospering so yeah i mean so so london's quite a quite a diverse place anyway i mean how have you found i don't know racial segregation in that sense i mean i just wondered how you found found the oppression in that in in comedy particularly yeah so like when when it comes to like i I think race has always been there i think down towards what probably about 10 years ago it was getting pushed down a little bit and it became more of a taboo thing whereas now where you have like the rise of "Quote unquote alt right politics and Donald Trump and Brexit, it's coming to the forefront again. It's kind of lifted the sheet yeah. off of how we as a society were trying to cover it up. So I think in the long run, this will probably be a good thing because it brings out the left, the left side. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It, it shows you what people really are, and like we're not actually as far <laughs> gone as we thought we were. Um, but when it comes to comedy, again, you see it. You 100 percent see it." Um, when when promoters are booking lineups you mean yeah uh, again I, and I, we were talking about this off air as well weren't we where um you see it from an extent where you know a, a promotion a specific promotion you go through their four five six last last gigs and all of the comedians happen to be you know you know white um all from british backgrounds from the names and stuff yeah yeah but then as we were talking off air you have to kind of I'm not one of those people that likes the diversity quotas and like the the BBC diversity quotas we were talking about. I, I'm not a big fan of those. We need to investigate what the actual and understand what the actual problem is. You is need it to get fact- down to the core of it and yeah. why? Why is it still about? Why is this? It's like like you say the 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 birth of the right and the, the far right sort of um, racist kind of outlook that you get from people like Nigel Farage and, and his party and stuff it creates the birth of the, the extreme left. And really, the country's only ever been prosperous when you're somewhere in the middle. Yeah, uh, yeah so, a, a, mil- a million percent, man. Like Just to pick up on what you just said there, the extreme left are almost as ridiculous as the extreme right. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if, to bring it back to comedy, it's interesting It's interesting that promoters are still nervous. Do you think it's because of the content you might speak about? or I, In all honesty, I'm not 100% sure. So uh, it could be a conscious bias uh, based around material. Oh, you know, this is going to be a conservative white audience we don't yeah. want somebody to come in and talk about upset quote, the quote. balance yeah thing, exactly yeah. and like it could be anything it could be a sub a subconscious bias a conscious bias or it could generally just be a lack of talent uh, and that's something that people neglect I, I i don't personally think that that's an issue 
but we've never actually addressed that where you know could it could it be a lack of talent comedians that are now like up and coming um who aren't ready for those pro level gigs or semi pro gigs because i see it I, I see it on the open mic circuit there's there's a lot of black and ethnic minority comedians yeah. and even like you know gay comedians trans- transgender comedians you see a lot of them but it could be because our attitudes over the years have changed so much that they now that they now feel comfortable to put themselves in a position to be in front of an audience. It's really it's a really weird one, and it's quite difficult for me as a white person <laughs> to to talk about it because I I naturally have to be careful myself. <laughs> yeah. um, but do you think that because of the the swing to the left, it's opened a door for people to come out and be ethnic or be different or be you know to be to come out and be be gay openly on stage? And do you think that now there's actually a saturated market in that sense that of people that are trying to do the same thing. It's, it is really hard to say. And like one of the things that I always say to people, I don't have the answers. I just raise questions. <laughs> <laughs> like, so and that's this... a, that is a really good question as well, where, you know, I do bump into it, a lot of people who are, who are doing different kinds of nights. Okay. So this is a LBGTQ night. This is, I've never seen an ethnic night actually, but like <laughs> LBGTQ tends to be a big one or like, yeah. You know, you, you see it in the comedy collective all the time like, because they're like, trying to make their lineups diverse. So they're like, okay, only female comedians. Yeah. Or only, okay, I need, you know, somebody who's not a straight white dude. And I kind of think if I was a straight white dude and I was a comedian and like, you know, you've been working your ass off for however long, you yeah. know, you've been doing it for six years or whatever. And like, you see that, that'd be so demoralizing. You're like, I'm good enough for this gig, but I can't, can't apply because they're trying to make the lineup diverse. Does it not highlight the issue by having to have all female lineups or all ethnic lineups because or or giving giving people opportunities purely because they're from an ethnic background and in some ways that's racist in itself because you're segregating them anyway you know it might be great that they get an opportunity but you're actually just highlighting that there is an issue yeah so effectively what you're doing with let's say let's say a promoter is running a (laughs) night and he realizes okay shit i've only got straight white dudes on this lineup let me go out and get a um, lesbian black female comic. In yeah. your head, you've you, you've already separated them out into a group Two that's separate yeah. to an actual comedian. Yeah, it's like what you should be doing is you should be endeavouring to treat everybody the, the same way. Because equality is equality. Yeah, and like it speaking, is split down the middle. A hundred percent, and and like seeing. And I, and I do think, so the equality point there, I do think that there has to be a sense of equity in there. And that's the actual balancing point. How do you balance equity and equality? Yeah. So if you're, if you're noticing, okay, across the London comedy scene, we've got a hundred, conservative estimate, a hundred comedy nights running. And out of those hundred nights, only two have like representative lineups. Okay, shit, we need to get some equity in here. Mm. But then, what should be done is that there should be an actual consideration for okay, what's the what's the driving factor behind it? Are we actually are all promoters racist, or is there a lack of talent, or do we have um, a subconscious bias, mm. or is it as we as comedians? So I again going back to me because I don't <laughs> I don't want to get caught up in this ratio. <laughs> like, some, somebody's tweeting on Twitter. Oh, we got a brown token brown guy. He's, he's fucking coconut. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he said it himself he said it himself oh no no I use coconut freely I know so many coconuts man yeah. I, I fucking hate them no uh, no, I don't I don't don't report me um, Jesus <laughs> nah I'm uh, <laughs> um, going back to myself as well when I when I do quote unquote white people jokes and a lot of my set is based around the the interaction between the traditional Punjabi cultural side of me and grown up brown yeah, and interacting with the wider white world. So most of my friends growing up were white. Um, people are coming to like I, I date white and like all all of that sort of stuff. And I think there's so much humor to be gained from there, from those two worlds interacting. So I think um, I think you have to make a conscious effort to actually engage with the audience. So when I do these white people jokes, I have to package them up in a way where I'm like, right from the outset, I'm not attacking any group of people. Yeah. This is actually my world. So I noticed the differences in white people and how um, when I date a white girl, she'll have questions that come across so ignorant. It's funny. Like yeah, being yeah. asked if I'm doing Ramadan. And you're like, we've been dating for eight months, bitch. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what are you doing? Uh, and then like the the brown world as well, where my parents would just be like, you know, 
they don't understand they don't have the that cultural understanding of why white people do certain shit like yeah. debt personal debt is such a white thing that that should be on the national flag white people love personal <laughs> debt car Which loans minus, credit yeah minus sign. <laughs> yeah exactly just good <laughs> car, credit oh. cards all that shit and they'll never understand that that sort of stuff and I, when i pick up on it it's, it's different to me yeah yeah it's, 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 it's just one of those things and i think we can't shy away and you mentioned something there as well where you were like i have to be careful talking about race of course you do, because I, I, because it would take, be taken out of context. Yeah, a, a million percent. If I was to edit it up and I was like to to fuck around with my vocal cords and be like, "Yo, man, that guy called me a coconut." Like, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> I really get you into some shit, but I think white people and I see dumb shit on Twitter as well, man. I know this is so disorganized, but like, I've got so many thoughts in my head. Uh, <laughs> I see dumb shit on Twitter all the time as well. Like, I saw a tweet from one of these quote-unquote woke accounts. Uh, okay. I think it was from yeah. America. I think it was from America, mm. and what I heard was oh, white people should not be involved in any conversation about race. I'm like, no, because like, that's not how, a, a, like, you don't, that's not how you build a functioning multicultural society. No, exactly. You have to uh, allay people's fears. You have to bring them into the conversation and come up to, you know, even if like ignorant white people, like, uh, and I think a lot of like this shift to the right is actually based on ignorance. Mm. Um, like not actually knowing or understanding it. Or not being willing yeah. to understand it. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think if I was to go up to the average lay person, be they black, brown, white, and ask them, okay, what contribution have immigrants made to society? They couldn't give a quantifiable answer. Yeah, you can't say, okay, immigrants actually contribute X to the economy, or immigrants. And like, again, some of it's just dumb shit. Like you can see, I walk down the average high street, and you'll see a curry house. So imagine if that curry house was a roast shop. Like, that'd be fucking awful. Roast white people are awful. Up your gravy game. That's all I can say. <laughs> like, <laughs> Excuse me, mate. I find that very offensive. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. Report me to Twitter. You, yeah. Start your own movement. Start no. <laughs> white people's movement. Bring bring back English culture. What is, bring, <laughs> what, is, what, is, what is English culture? This was flowers. For as long as I've been alive and my parents have been alive and before that and your parents have been alive, it, it, uh, culture in England is about multiculture. That's that. That is pretty much British culture. Yeah. And because if you go back to as early as like the fifties, you know the Carib- Caribbeans came over mm-hmm. to the, the UK and we welcomed them in and we we ate their food, we listened to their music, yeah, and everything like that. We we have always been open to these things, and I think yep. that's something that Britain should be proud of. Is that across the world we're one of the, we're one of the main sort of hubs for multiculture. Yeah. And I just think the way we're going about it is wrong. I mean, this whole Brexit thing saddens me, like just purely because yeah. and, I, and I like this. I like this podcast to be like, you know, I like it not to be like set in time. So people, people can come back. <laughs> yeah, to it. Yeah, so yeah. if you listen to this in five years time, are we out of Brexit or are we in Brexit? <laughs> what, what actually happened? While well, you're gnawing on the bone of like some toddler baby, like just fucking running out of food and shit. I, I record, I record two versions. One, one that we're out of Brexit <laughs> and one that we're in still. Uh, and, but yeah, no, I, I think exactly. And I think everybody, near enough, every sane person who doesn't have like their own private agenda acknowledges multiculturalism is a good thing. Yeah. And I, and again, part of my set is devoted to how coming into like British culture is actually, um, been beneficial to our traditional culture. Yeah. And it dilutes some of the, the traditions there, like arranged marriage. Arranged marriage is a big, big big portion of my um mm. my 20 minute set yeah yeah and it's like that it's is not forced my marriage it's arranged yeah so. yeah yeah but then like i i'm like so thankful that we moved to fucking england just so i don't have to get an arranged marriage like yeah. <laughs> you know like and and it dilutes that element of all Do you cultures. know i know i know quite a lot of white british people that would appreciate such an easy ride <laughs> without having to swipe laboriously on twinder until you finally find somebody that yeah. actually likes the way you look and actually, just know that your parents have already sorted it out for you. True, you don't have to. You don't have to shower. You don't have to dress yeah. up. You just turn yeah. up one day and you're like, "Oh shit, it's my wedding. This is great." Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, and and like we need that appreciation, and I think that should actually be emphasised more in schools, where it's like there is no succinct, there is no um, siloed British culture, there is no siloed um, Indian culture in Britain, there is no siloed Somalian culture. Everybody intermingles yeah. and creates this melting pot, which then gives a rise to like one of the best things about me. I think is the fact that I'm bilingual and yeah. have a appreciation for two two different cultures. Yeah, absolutely. Creating yeah. a third culture, 
And then you're like, okay, shit, I understand all of these different facets of society. Yeah. Whereas if I was cut off from one of them, I'd be fucked. Yeah, that's true. You speak about schools. I mean, I when I was at when I was at school, I was in primary school. Yeah. All right. There, there was still like a slight hangover of of kind of like a racist era. Like you remember in the, like the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was was pretty bad for anyone that isn't. Yeah. Um, like white in England with the, with like the skinheads and and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well. I had a teacher that came in. I went into the worst. It was the worst school in Cambridge. Yeah. It, was very, it was in the history, but it was literally the worst one in the whole of Cambridge. And we had a... Worst like, school in Cambridge is very much like saying you're the poorest billionaire. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. i have been mugged before by a Cambridge person and they only needed the money for a, a tailored seafood bag. So. Yeah, sorry, carry on. Go on, no intro. That's all right. So there, we had, um, we had a, a head teacher that came in for special measures, like just as a temporary yeah. measure. And he was the most sort of right wing prick you'd ever meet. And I always remember one thing he did was someone, someone took a shit in your Arnold, which is never, <laughs> which is never good. Nope. Like, isn't it? no, none of us thought it was cool that someone did that. Yeah. But he called all the boys into the, the into the assembly, and we're all at seven years old. And he just turned around and said, "Someone has taken a shit <laughs> in the urinals," and everyone just laughed. Of yeah. course, we're seven. But there was when the, around that time the Brazil. It was the Brazil World Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and it was because of the time shift. We we got it was in the morning the game, so we got to we basically got to see the second half before school started. So yeah. we'd all go into the assembly and and go yeah. and watch it. But the the day before that that England game against Brazil, he had those. Do you remember those old projectors that you'd have those those like their plastic sheet and they'd yeah. write like like song lyrics on it and you'd all have to sing it. Yeah. Right. He had that up and he projected it on and it was just England, <laughs> England, and he got the entire school to sing it. Yeah. Right. And we and that was one of the most because the area I grew up with. I mean, uh, relative relative. Relative to the rest of Cambridge, it was a shithole. Yeah. Right? So it was like one of those places that had all the multicultural in one place. And looking back, that is so wrong. <laughs> that is so wrong to be to have that assembly where you're getting people from all over the world or a second generation yeah. from all over the world oh, to see, sing the England an English anthem. Oh, see, so I so uh, this is we've taken a weird turn into dystopia because I'm about to disagree with you here. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a white guy being like, that's fucked up. And I'm like, well... So I, I remember... I remember growing up, so growing up, my parents were very, so I come from a, uh, a Sikh household, right? Right. So both my parents are Sikh. My mum especially, she's very religious. Always has been. So I remember being five or six and at our school assemblies, they'd get us to sing hymns, like Christian yeah, Church yeah, of yeah. England sim, uh, hymns. And I went home to my mum and I was like, mum, can we, like, are you comfortable with this? They're, they're like, Jesus this, Jesus that. And my mum was like, listen, man, like, do you think you're Christian? Did she call you man? <laughs> yeah, yeah. My mum's very, very ghetto. She'd elbow me. No, no, no. Um, she was like, she was like, oh. All right, mate. <laughs> yeah. Fucking hell, right? Do you fucking think you're Christian, son? No, um, she was like, oh, do you actually, like, are you Christian or are you Sikh? And I was like, I'm, I'm Sikh. She was like, well, there you go then. You can say whatever you want. Just go, go take part. And I think that, that appreciation was there, but from like my mum's perspective, she was like, okay. So this this is the way that school does things, and it's the Church of England school. Yeah. So just do it. So and I, the, sorry, I, I digressed again. But the ch- the England chant that you mean, the England anthem that you, that you were talking about there, I think patriot, patriotism is dumb on a wider scale. But when it comes to like football and sports events and shit, I think if you don't want to sing it, you shouldn't be forced to sing it. No. Like so nobody should be taken out of that assembly and like. I don't know, it was a right-wing school beaten or some shit or molested. I don't know, right-wing people do weird shit. Um, but like, it's not, it's, it's not an inherently bad thing. You're in England, it's, it's an English football team. If you don't want to sing it, don't sing it. Yeah. If you're not into football, you're not into football. What about, what about people? This is another thing that annoys people in England. Yeah. And we don't, we, we can't really say much about it. That's the annoying thing. What about flying flags around like football time as well? Like, <laughs> it, it goes mental. Like, people get banned from having flags as the British thing. But wherever you go, and if you go in Europe, yeah, um, you can do what you want. Like, that's yeah, fine. it's it, again, it's strange. So, I I've got a weird relationship with England flags. And um, when we were poor, when we were younger, we were pretty poor, so we used to go to all of these like seaside towns and stuff in lieu of actual proper abroad holidays. Yeah, and um, we were going down to a place called Hailing Island, which is down towards Portsmouth. One of my dad's friends had recommended. My dad has a lot of white friends, and one of his friends had recommended it. He was like, "Oh, it's a brilliant town." Go on, go on, son. Just take your family there. That was like, okay, cool. 
And when we were going down there, as we got more and more into like right wing territory, all we could see was England flags, yeah. like those British flags with the bulldog on it and stuff. Oh god, yeah. And we're like, okay, where, where are we actually going? And that was the first flag to notice that something was up. We get to the park and we're in there for three minutes generally so i'm eight at this time my brother's five i'm with my cousin he's about 13 14 and my two parents we go in and to the right there's a roller coaster and this is a genuine true story sounds like i'm bullshitting right so we go into the park we've walked into the seaside pier bit and somebody at the top of a roller coaster just pointed down at us and shouted "Packy!" no way i swear down to you but because the roller coaster has gone down at the same time it's become elongated So it's just become this massive scream. Everybody in the park turns around and looks at us, not the guy shouting the racial abuse. (laughs) (laughs) And that's my relationship with England flags. And what what happened afterwards? Like We had to leave. You just had to go. Yeah, Yeah. and later on, there was actually a a stabbing in that same park where a black dude did get stabbed. I don't know if it's racially motivated, but we didn't see any other ethnic people while we were down there. Just go, where was this? Hailing Island. It's down towards um, Portsmouth Way. I'm okay. sure it's a real nice place now, so don't hate me, people. At eight years old, to go through that is pretty bad. I mean, yeah, it it, it, it was it was strange because like my mum used to tell me stories about the National Front, and like there was a story where the National Front actually came to a park by our house, and my dad was at work, and my mum had to flee the National Front, and they were knocking on doors and stuff, and she had to hide in her own house because you could see into our living room, so she hid behind a sofa. They were knocking down, like skinheads were knocking on doors to be like, oh, we're looking for any blacks or packies. And that was that was like a run. Of, so like we grew up with this shit and my parents didn't really shelter us from it. And they were very much like, a, you know, these are just bad people. You can't like judge. Yeah, exactly. People. Yeah. It doesn't, it, it's not, it's, you know, they're, they're not bad people because they don't understand. They're just bad people. Yes. Well, it doesn't matter where you're from or what you believe in. Yeah. If you're a prick, you're a prick. Yeah, hundred you know percent. I mean, yeah. it's just uh, that's just a universal thing. Yeah, you know, a prick is a prick. Yeah, hundred um, <laughs> percent. And then like them taking that approach really meant that you could like distinguish between the two. So you're never like sheltered from it. So you're like, okay, no, that's racial abuse. It's wrong, but not all people are going to be like that. Yeah. And thankfully, there to that level, there's only been like a handful of instances. Tell me about the worst gig you've ever had. The worst gig would probably be... So I'd done the Blackout Up the Creek. This is probably about six months ago. Oh, I know Up the Creek, yeah. Yeah, so it's like a room, which is like... So it's like a gong show style. Yeah, uh, yeah. Amazing, like 150 people. I don't know how, how many actually. 150 to 200 people in a room. I was sold out that day, packed at the back. I did really well. Really well. Like, got, got a video, went incredibly well. Did my full five minutes. The next day, I was booked to do an open mic. Yeah. Literally a stone's throw away from the place as well in East London. Yeah. And again, it, I was expecting open mic is going to be about 20 people. Got there, it was about 60 people. I don't know what happened. I did the same set, but I watched the video back again. I think it was nerves or something. I don't know what it was. I had not one laugh. Really? And that, yeah. how, how was that as a five minute set? F- uh, five minute set, I think it ended up being a seven minute set because I didn't want to leave on like no laughs. <laughs> so I just kept on going. One for the record. Absolutely awful. But since then, I realised, okay, I have to treat different audiences in different ways. Yeah, I think that would divide people as well that because if you think about it, if you do your five minute set and you get dynamite at that five minute set, yeah. that's the that's the set that's probably going to get you noticed yeah. eventually. Right, so one of the first things you learn in comedy is to just get your solid five minutes and then just repeat it for about a year. Yeah, and then after that, start playing with it a bit more, but just get that absolutely dynamite. Um, yeah. So, so I had, so just picking up on that, I had differing. So I, I heard different views. Like a lot of people did say that, like stick to that five minutes, just get it right, do this. But then I always found that I, if I'm if I, if I fuck around with, so. I was fucking around with it too much at the start to the point where it just wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. I got my five minutes locked in and then I just started messing around with that. I turned that five minutes into 10 minutes. Yeah. By and adding then, a few little bits. By yeah. adding a few little bits, different ideas and stuff. But then since then, now I just like, sometimes I'll go up on an open mic stage and just do crowd work. Yeah. And then that's yeah. how you Which like, is equally good to do because if you can learn to do that, then if your five minute or 10 minute set is going falling flat, 
you've yeah. got that in the bag. You can always you can always go to the okay, what's happened in the room today? Yeah. What can I pick on in this room today? And I was talking to the last podcast that I did with Paul Kerr. He was telling me about how he he does MC and just to learn how to interact with the audience so now if he he gets like two minutes of silence because one of his jokes haven't been landing he knows then he can just pick on something that's happened and just and just run and run that way and come yeah. back maybe to yeah a, a million percent i think that's what i'm kind of learning now as well where it's like if some some crowds they say it's a 40 strong crowd at an open mic night let's say 20 of them are from the same work do they don't yeah. want to sit there and listen to you do your five minutes of earth shattering material they want they want you to pick on people they yeah. want you to pick on their friends and that's half the room there and then if you can turn that into some and I've, uh, that's actually based on a real experience as well where two minutes of my material didn't work i had 10 minutes to go for the next eight minutes i fucked around i ended up doing fucking great yeah uh, and that's something you learn i think and i'm still learning which is which is great. That's what makes this so fun, man. Yeah, you'll never stop learning, man. Yeah, like it's really it's fun. It's funny when people watch um like proper big TV names and then they think that that's what being a comedian is about <laughs> because yeah. because I was speaking to Martin Westgate um a few weeks back and he was you know he was saying advising people to just watch people that are on the circuit. Yeah. So watch the the people that may not be TV names but the ones that work in like the normal comedy clubs and yeah. open mic nights and stuff like that because if they're experienced they're the ones that are doing the real work where they're having yeah. to gauge audiences, having to absorb what's happening in the room and then do a set based on what they've, they've seen. I mean, I've seen comedians come to gigs late and then done a set that's been pretty much covered throughout that set. Yes. So, you know, if he comes on a day, someone does like, I don't know, Trump stuff, but people have already had Trump jokes. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just, it's just hard. You have to gauge that. I always like to be there pretty early so I can read the room. Yeah. And if like and you you measure people that have been on before you, so sometimes you can do a bit off the back of something they've they've done or of something that's happened in the room. Like recently, there was a there was a German couple in our in our in our, in in one one of my gigs, yeah. and it was hilarious because they 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 were a great sport, but everyone kept speaking to them. So then there were, there were like a whole loads of jokes that had right. been created because of that. So then to 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 add on to that particular running joke for the whole yeah. night was was just easy work. And how, how how long do you think it took you to learn that as in to really engage with what's happening in the room? I think, I think the more you die, the more you notice it. So like I, um, so yeah, there was one, there was one where someone did a whole set about wanking, about living alone. <laughs> right. And it was actually Paul Kerr and he was talking about living alone and I could listen to um, everything quite loudly. I have a loud wank yeah. and everything like that because he lives alone and stuff. And, and I've, I've advised him to get a surround system because it adds to the whole, <laughs> the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. Anyway, so I went on and I said, well, I'm glad he's enjoying living alone. But when I lived alone, I used to have a crank as crying and wanking at the same time. <laughs> But if you time the tears, you can use it as lubrication. Nice, yeah. And that was just off the back of his set. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and sometimes I think if you have like a half-baked idea as well, and something in the room's happened, where... So I, I, I had an... <laughs> please don't judge me, people, but I had an R. Kelly bit. Right? Okay, yeah, well, that, that would have worked about a month ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, now it's all about Michael Jackson. You could... Yeah. Into, but I had an R. Kelly bit, which I really wanted to like... And it was half-baked. It wasn't stage-ready. But then I found somebody in the stage who was, they were on a date and the, the, the woman was really, looked really young. Right. And the dude looked really old and they were like, oh, we've been together for like four years. That, that's definitely, oh, they've been together for that. Uh, yeah. So, I would have looked at that and think that's definitely a Tinder date. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. You would have thought so, but I don't know how he secured this. Like, seriously, it was like world class level. He didn't look rich or anything. But anyways, and, and <laughs> off the back of that, like everything just fit my R. Kelly stuff. Right. The back, and the crowd was like what a raucous crowd it was late night they really loved that shit yeah yeah, yeah. since then my, that set again it's gone into the drawers into the abyss yeah <laughs> until R. Kelly does some other fucked up shit I'm the only person that's hoping R. Kelly doesn't go to prison so he can carry on doing all this shit so I can get that <laughs> set out again yeah I, oh, so sad <laughs> <laughs> you guys can't see it but that was a real disgusted face there. <laughs> What's your sense of humour like? What the fuck? That's yeah, a no, weird question. No, no, no. no. I, so I ask this question. And I like. I like to. I like encountering other because mine's quite wide. So I go from like James Acaster. 
Yeah, to Dave yeah. Chappelle, or like I'm, I'm Jim a big Jeffries. fan of Dave, uh, James Acaster. He's he's one of those that's remained pretty humble throughout it. I mean, yeah. I know I don't I don't I don't I don't know him personally or that well, but I I know people that have, you yeah, know yeah. comedians that know him quite well and stuff. I've seen him at the Red River Fringe and all that sort of stuff. And I know that he he did a gig for someone this side <laughs> near in Cambridge and. He, at the end of the set, he said, that was shit. I don't want to be paid for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Literally, he said it was, wasn't good enough. So he's, so he's still, he still does clubs and stuff like that. Yeah. So, you know, he, he's, he's one of those who's gone from, like, being seriously poor, but getting, like, stranded in, in like, cities yeah. because he's got no way of getting home mm. and having to sleep in a bush. Yeah. To where he is now. So I think he's one of those that's really... Builds that character, doesn't it? That, that, that kind of... Journey. Yeah, he's lucky though in that sense because he does so many scrapes like that. Because mm. he does this classic scrapes thing, and, and it's unbelievable. It's, it's it's hard to believe that most of that's true. Yeah, like the stuff that's happened to him, like he's crashed his car numerous times. Um, he's nearly died numerous times. He's nearly killed people numerous times from just driving. So he stopped yeah. driving because of that. <laughs> his insurance got too expensive. Yeah, and yeah, but he 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 deserves everything he gets because he's really worked. He's one of those comedians that's gone through the hard ten year. Yeah, route. slog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but like what? So, so yeah, so going circling back to the question, what's your what's your personal sense of humor like? Are you tend to be pretty I, I, dark, I range whimsical? From it. I like I like dark. I think dark's good because I think you you need to joke about the things that are hard. It, it varies really. I mean, I, I going what I grew up watching were things like Only Fools and Horses and and programs like that and faulty towers and and all sorts of yeah they, they're the things that i watched growing up but in terms of stand-up comedy billy Connolly was right, yeah. probably it's probably is will always be my all-time favorite, favorite comedian and it's you know you, you you go through your favorites and then and then someone like peter k who did the, like the relatable stuff that kind of started that and um, was one of the main ones to start the kind of family stuff so now yeah. you've got people like michael mcintyre that are doing work on the back of that mm-hmm. um you know the real relatable stuff and then and then as far as people like joe joe wilkinson yeah, who, oh, that, yeah. he just cracks me up yeah, because of his yeah, whole yeah. persona and i know it's a character but i just i just it just makes me laugh so much and then people like diane morgan who he, he was just one of his double acts yeah, yeah. They, they did a, had a double act together i think when she did like that kunk on britain oh that, she does that so stupid ignorant yes, sort of person yeah, yeah, yeah. she does that so brilliantly um, I think, unfortunately for her, there was someone like Carl Pilkington came out, and he was genuinely just stupid. Yes. Yeah. So her stuff looked like a bit a bit manufactured. Yeah. But I, I I love um, Catherine Ryan as well. Yeah, Catherine Ryan's great. I yeah, I I do actually really like her as well. And, and I'm surprised that a lot of people like say negative shit about like even on Twitter and stuff they'll say negative stuff about her. But I'm like her joke writing is on point. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, I saw her Netflix special as well, and it was like laugh out loud, funny and stuff. But, I don't know, there's there's so, so many comedians, man. What's the one gig that you, you've come out of and you thought, fucking hell, I'm great at this? Uh, not to brag, but there have been a couple like that. <laughs> um, I would say the first time I did the blackout out of the creek, for that 24 hour period was it was just great afterwards I was like shit so I can control the room I can do this um Brighton in general has been great oh emceeing uh my first MC spot that was uh, you really enjoyed that yes yeah, uh, yeah so it, I think crowd work and emceeing because you can weave your material and stuff in mm. but then you could all like it is your job to play on what's going on in the room get to know people in that room come up with punchlines on the spot that went really well. And then I was like, okay, this is awesome. And now I've got, I think over the next like 10 days, I've got three MC gigs. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to those. I'm, uh, I'm looking to just get out there, fuck around with the crowd. And um, So you, are you going to use that to get, get that bit more sort of confidence in that? Are you, so, yeah. And then bring that eventually into your, your standard set. Yeah, a hundred percent. So I've actually started doing that now. If I get like a 20 minute spot, um, I'll always, there's, there's like a couple of holes in, the, in, in my bits where I can play on what's going on in the room and I'm, yeah. I'm trying to build my set into that way where I can have that interaction um, it's not for all rooms so that's what I'm trying to figure out and figure out how to actually do that properly rather than it just sort of be some idiot rambling on kind of like how I've been on this podcast <laughs> 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 that's where it's a conversation man that's where it's meant to be how long have you been in the game for again? I, well I, I did I did my first sort of gigs when I was like 16 Oh, I'm really young, and yeah. then I stopped because 
what what followed was like a, a manic episode with bipolar. So I right. I, I, I you know I I saw quite quite a negative thing attached to comedy. So I I just put it off for so many years. Gotcha. So I only came back to it a couple of years ago and yeah. and yeah. So now I'm just I'm just I, I was writing for probably that whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, and now and now I've. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm just just gigging as much as possible, really. And do you think do you think people have an appreciation for how hard it is to actually do comedy? I think or so. Do you think it's like overstated? I think so because no one no one likes to see an, a, a comedian die on their ass. <laughs> like I think there's a there, there's an element of people feel guilty, like they, they've got yeah. up and they've done that, but they're not funny. And I, I, there's nothing worse than coming off and someone like, "Well done for getting up." <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> like, or pity laughs. Yeah, I hate fucking pity laughs. Oh, I don't care, man. I, I'd take the laughs. No, no, no. <laughs> I call it out. I've I've had like situations where like a joke's flopped. Like I've done a whole build up to this yeah. one big punchline and the big punchline's flopped and then there's a pause where everybody's like what the fuck there'll be somebody who's like extra supportive gives it a laugh and I'm like fuck you yeah, fuck I once, you grenadine yeah <laughs> I once forgot my I once forgot my um what's it I, f- I forgot what I was gonna I forgot what I was gonna say now <laughs> but I once I once forgot my set like part of the way through I just got lost in my set I think it was one of the first gigs I ever did yeah and all I could hear was my my missus laughing right oh. so she laughs as I did it <laughs> Oh, so, shit. but then, but then that caused a laugh around the room. Yeah, and I, I went down the route and I said, "It's good to know that I brought my, my lady across because I'm just about to die my ass, and she's the only one that can laugh." Right now. <laughs> and then it recovered the situation, oh, and no. I, I got in and recovered it. You know, continued the set. But, yeah, you know, sometimes I hope for things like that to happen because it actually just helps you along. But yeah, yeah I'm not, I'm not that experienced in it, man. But I've done, I've done some big gigs. I mean, I've done mirth, mirth control comedy, yeah. which is a big deal in Cambridge. I think they have places out like in Farnham and Farnham and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I, I want to get out of doing like five minute sets now. My, the night I run, I do ten minute sets now minimum. Occasionally, yeah. I might get the odd five minute in, but I think it's important to break away from five yeah. minutes. There's so many in London, but people like Martin Westgate have never never did five minutes. When being in Norwich, he he did. You know, he started on tens, yeah. and now he struggles to do tens because yeah, it's um. It, it's quite hard to to get a message across in five minutes. Yeah, with five minutes, I, I like, uh, and that's one of the big beefs I have with competitions. It's like, despite like progressing at a rate that I'm pretty happy with. Yeah. With competitions, I, I've I've never been decent at competitions, man. I could do gong like the blackout and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like I'm fine with that because. So with the gong, I'm interested with gong. Uh, with did you did you change your set at all for that? Did you do like did you try and keep like the punchlines? like close together yeah yeah, yeah. so with not, uh, less so with the blackout because they just time you out They're, like you'll know when your five is up and then that's right. it you've done it okay. but with competitions I think I always try and pack in as much quote unquote good material with the punchlines basically yeah yeah and strip it down so it's just as many laughs as possible and I think that actually fucks my set up really I think it takes away from I think if you take away the general points out of my set mm. and the slow build ups to some of the bits they don't land quite as clean yeah, and that's what I find with competitions where it's like, and if you don't do that, then your set comes across as a bit slow and a bit laboured compared to somebody who's dropping six, seven gags a minute, mm. and then you're like, oh, you know, you can't win either way, I guess. I haven't seen you perform yet, so I'd, I'd have to come down and see you sometime, or at least yeah. have you at my night or something. And uh, do you have like a high energy sort of set, or are you quite low energy, or does uh, that depend whether it's new material or not? It depends on it depends on the bit. Uh, I try I'll always, always try and be into the material if that makes sense. So I'll always try and attach an emotion to something. I'll have like, um, I'll have an overarching narrative. So let's say my, my 10 minutes now is two and a half minutes is about this TSA story. Yeah. About going through airport security. Uh, and then the next seven and a half minutes is relationships. So that's the overarching na- narrative. Yeah. With that. Yeah. But in there, there's like three main emotions, uh, which is like anger, anger, uh, disgust, and then finally the light and airy bit right at the end. Mm. And what I'll try and do is I'll weave those three emotions into that set at the right bits. Okay. And if I don't have high energy, if I'm not into it, or if I don't, I guess I try and have a high level of performance. I have to have the right level of performance. Energy doesn't really matter. Even if I'm, going for something that's a little bit more low energy 
I need to have that level of performance and really perform mm. it in that way and like understand that in my head. But I would say I'm <laughs> I'm somewhere in the middle, I guess. That's such yeah. a bullshit response. <laughs> uh, but it's I'm just not, tepid water. Yeah, that is if that, oh, wow, that is going on my next poster. That is just, <laughs> it's like tepid water. Like I try and if I'm too high energy, like some of my material is too dark for that, then it just contrasts way too much, yeah. and like people. Wouldn't is that it. you? Do you want that as a review now? Do you? Yeah, hundred <laughs> just tepid water. It's just tepid. Like, fucking just dangerous. Tepid. There's diseases in this shit. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah I don't know I, and I guess that's a point as well actually because I'm so like, early on into everything I guess I'm still playing around with like who I am as a comedian yeah you've got to find your voice there you yeah, go yeah find word, your stage yeah. voice mm. I guess first uh, previously I was like too I guess I didn't have that there was that base insecurity there of shit yeah. what if this doesn't work and I'm really into it then it just looks like I'm bombing or well, if I don't give a shit about it and I'm low energy it'll be fine but then low energy doesn't work and then, like, as soon as I built up, got rid of that insecurity of what if I'm not funny on the night, then it started, go, like, going places. Yeah. Where, like, yeah. and then, like, even in the smaller gigs, it, stuff will start to work because you're into it and, like, people buy into it more. Yeah. Um, Did you know what? One of the things that motivates me the most about, about all of this is actually dying on stage. When it doesn't work, I actually, when I get back in that car... I, I often just literally run the whole set through my head again yeah. and just and actually perform it again in the car. I've done it I've done it loads of times yeah. where I just I just get out of there and and I'm not saying I've died loads of times, right? I've not died loads of times. Yeah. I, <laughs> I just but if I but there's not one gig that I go I come out of and I think I've absolutely stormed it. I always think that I always remember the bits I didn't do right or yeah. do it right, you know? So then I go back into the, and or on the way to a gig, I'm practicing all the way to the gig and then I get on there and sometimes it just doesn't work and I'm like it's nowhere near what I just did, dynamite in the car. Yeah. But the thing that motivates me to write, in fact, is is one I'm driven by affirmation and driven by positivity and all those things that, like you know, you know praise obviously yeah. drives me. But sometimes I think, no, I want to bounce back from this, and, that, and yeah. I just want to get back on that stage and do it again and kill it this time. Yeah, you you have to have that almost borderline level of disdain for people who tell you, oh, okay, yeah, that. That was okay. You're like, oh, you did great, but you know you haven't. And I always, I always have this mindset of if somebody tells me, oh no, maybe you just need to change this bit here. I was yeah. like, fuck you. This I, shit's gonna work. I remember listening to. I don't know if you know of Robin Ince. He's a yeah. comedian yeah, himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he did. He supported Ricky Gervais years back. Yeah. And anyway, he does. He was telling me that. Um, well, he wasn't telling me. Fucking hell. God, who am I? Yeah. <laughs> Robin Ince was was on a podcast with Ricky Gervais, and and he was talking about about when he when when he was first on the circuit and stuff, mm. and or going you know working the clubs and stuff because he still does them. Coming out of there, and, and then people saying like I, people asking him what they thought of his set of the, of their set, yeah, right. And he's and if he was honest with them, they were like, oh, really? Did you really think that? Uh, like <laughs> when people get over defensive about what they're saying, <laughs> yeah. so why are you asking in the first place? Yeah, like, if you don't want to hear bad criticism, don't yeah. don't ask. Exactly. And yeah. On the um, on the flip side, don't come out and say, "Well, that was shit." And then if someone agrees with you, yeah. they go, "Oh, really? Was it? I didn't think it was that bad." Well, you just said it was shit yourself. So, yeah. you, what do you want from us? It's, like, it's weird. I feel like some like the more experienced acts I've been in. Actually, a fairly recent story. So, um, a comedian called Ria Lena. I she she was on the same night as me in Reading. I, the gig went pretty well, but then she 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 was speaking to me about one of my bits, and she came up with some really good constructive. I don't even think it was criticism. It was more of a like pointers, like different ideas associated yeah. to that. She was like, "Oh, have you thought about this?" And, have, and from there, like, I'm now rewriting that bit where it's like now I'm like, "Oh shit, yeah." There's so much more scope here. Yeah, and it can, it was be, like, it can be difficult to receive criticism in the first instance yes. because it comes across as if you've literally just come off stage. You don't want to hear that it went badly because at that point you actually just want to convince yeah. yourself that what you did was alright. But on reflection on these things really helpful yeah and I think you can't be you can't have that level of protection around and I, I, it's only natural like this is literally from the idea through to the finishing punchline you've constructed this from your own hand so it's easy to be defensive about stuff yeah and like overprotective but then if somebody pitches it to you in the right way or you are genuinely looking for some pointers I think you should ask and then somebody then the other person should have the emotional intelligence to be like look I'm not going to tell you it's all shit. These bits I loved, but have you thought or investigated the possibility of going down this route or attaching this idea to it or 
whatever. And when somebody comes up with constructing and almost forces you into rethinking certain things, mm. I think that's where the constructive element comes from. Where it's like, they're not telling you it didn't work or you should you shouldn't do it like that. What they're saying is, have a think about this, this, and this. And then which they is, fire which those. Is constructive, yeah. yeah. They fire off those neurons in your own head. And then boom, they're, they're, yeah. that's actually constructive. Coming off and someone saying that was amazing or that was shit are two things that don't work. That doesn't really binary, help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> binary, that's such a <laughs> um, it's, it's in like modern vocabulary yeah. everywhere now. It's like woke. <laughs> yeah, off. Oh, uh, no, we're gonna get started on modern culture again as well. We're gonna be here for another <laughs> six hours, man. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> He's already bored of my company, so we're gonna have to wrap up. Yeah, cool, cool. That's uh, fine. You are. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm fucking around. I'm fucking around. <laughs> <laughs> your eyes winded. I'm fucking around. I'm joking. I've got yeah. as much time as you want. <laughs> Prick. What, what time is your tin today? Uh, I need to be in London for about 7, 8 ish. All right, okay. Well, we're going to finish off anyway. Brother, I love Tinder, okay? We were yeah. talking. You mentioned Tinder earlier. I was well, like- okay. Let's, let's lead into this because <laughs> um, one of the things that became apparent from doing this podcast was that people were single. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it became like a dating like platform for for like Don Mackey said he was single and yeah. he was after a girlfriend and then and then Kitty came on and, and basically marginalised pretty much every guy yeah, except yeah, a very yeah, yeah. specific you know type of person that she wanted <laughs> which is wrong in so many ways yep. and then I felt like I was a bit pimping pimping people out yep. and I did have Paul Kerr on and it was a great conversation with him but I didn't get on to the single topic but you're right. single yep, yep, I, yep. I'm not pimping you out and but I just I'd earn you way too much money there'd be a uh, money laundry concern <laughs> there <laughs> yeah yeah so tinder i mean i used to use tinder a lot and it was a, it was a numbers game yeah. it was just swipe bright until someone likes what i look like yeah you know and that's admittedly that's the way i worked i just like every other guy who uses yeah. tinder yeah, yeah. Right? i know there's there's bumble out which was big about a few months back i think and then and then the latest one is hitch i think is the one that's, that's uh hinge yeah. Hinge, hinge is a hinge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I'm clued up on that shit straight yeah. away. Hinge. I'm not because I've been in a relationship for a while. So I, <laughs> yeah, but I, I hear a lot. Put that out there, please don't yeah. kill him. <laughs> yeah, I hear a lot about this hinge and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah. So you love Tinder. You got a Tinder date tonight then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm off onto the Tinderings today. Uh, Tinder to me is like it's, it's incredible. So Tinder never actually worked for me until I listed my height on there. Oh, really? So for everybody watching and uh, ladies, I'm six foot two. Feel free to drop me a DM and that. Okay, please, thanks. Did I mention to you that I went on a date with a racist once? No. Nah. nah, so uh, went on a date with a... This is going back a few years now. So it was in Reading. Like I said, real multicultural place. Yeah, yeah. Um, we ended up uh, meeting up for a drink. We'd been talking for a good while. So like my, I've got like a full-on face picture. My name's on there. Um, like I don't have like a fake white name or anything like oh, I'm Harry <laughs> no <laughs> don't do that and um, so she met, met up and stuff and then you know when you can tell somebody's real awkward yeah. around you so I was like okay what's up like we're 10 minutes in like this is getting a little bit weird she's like oh nothing it's just um, I've never dated anybody that's not white I was like oh okay you know fair fair thing to say um, first time for everything she was like yeah mm, no I was like, okay. And then you she see proceed- my photo already. Then she, yeah, then she proceeded to tell me about how her dad's like full on EDL. Really? Like, yeah, yeah. And Fuck I was like, no. well, ironically, I really wanted a fucker then. Like, just <laughs> as, as payback. <laughs> but then, yeah, we left it. She Are came. you that shit in bed? Are you really that awful in bed that you wanted to put her through that and to get her back by having sex with her? Exactly. Yeah. She she would need a helpline call. She, she, she'd she be there. The, the, <laughs> oh, God. It was just and emotional glad, support is what she would have needed on that yeah, bed. I just need to remind myself that if I do ever do like a proper radio show, not to get you on it. <laughs> no, this is one of the things I love about podcasts, man. What does the next year in comedy hold for you, man? What do you, um, what do you hope to get out of the next year? So like I said, last like especially the last like month or so I would really say it's gone really well um, yeah I've got I've got a couple of major bookings coming up at some top level clubs in I'm, I'm the backyard uh, in July yeah um, so that, that I'm looking forward to that awesome gonna go up to Edinburgh this year for uh, a week or so yeah try, try and get on a compilation or something the goal uh, I had initially thought I was gonna try and get a full run out there but um, I don't think it's possible it's this year. It's expensive as well. It's yeah. expensive and I don't think I'm like there for like a full 45 hour slot. Uh, and that's what I'd want to do. Uh, yeah, I'd yeah, want to yeah. do a split for my first time. But I've got uh, an hour coming up in Reading. Uh, that'll be yeah. in 
June. Uh, there'll be more details and stuff about that. But I'm really just concentrating on becoming a better comedian. Um, yeah, yeah. That's that's the main goal, and that's what I'm going to try and go for. Yeah, just 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 get better. Just just improve. get better. Yeah. I would advise, like, I know, I know, some some people have gone up without, you know, within their first year or second year, um, up to Edinburgh. But it's worth it's worth just it's worth just going up there just with, which is the the, the distinct idea to absorb the issue, yeah. the the idea, you know, the whole place and watch some of the comics and get on, like you say, a compilation a uh, compilation thing because then you get a feel for the area anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, a hundred percent. You get, you kind of get to see what the festival is all about and yeah. stuff as well. But I think um, I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna really focus on just taking things as they come. Uh, yeah. A lot of the advice and stuff that I got from people around timings or when you should be doing this or shouldn't be doing this, as I, I, I found to be kind of redundant. Yeah. Um, people were saying don't do um, don't do bigger audiences until you're like three years in, four really? years in. Did you kind of think, well, you know, without it's, seeing yeah, me, I guess the reason is is because. If the more people are in there, the more that you could you could lose yeah, for future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is this thing that they say you won't make it in the city you start because so, they've seen you fly, yeah. fucking die so many times. Yeah, that yeah, and so if you do you do get to like a TV name or to do a tour, they won't be the ones coming to your gigs. Yeah, It'd be wherever whoever else has seen you. So yeah, uh, but that's fine. That's okay because then you'll always have like oh go back to the hometown to have. Like a like a year a homecoming, thing. yeah. yeah so. But yeah, no, that that that's that's the next year for me. Just keep getting better, uh, keep just building, and just having a f- having fun with it, man. Yeah, life's so deprived of fun. Like in, in general, if you look at like mm. just life in general, work a nine to five, oh, God. eat, yeah. sleep, shit. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> fuck if you're lucky, <laughs> your Tinder game's on point, and you're over six. <laughs> See how tonight goes, mate. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it's the, that's it, man. <laughs> that's, that's me that's me in a nutshell well thanks so much for joining me Pre. that's uh, been a really great conversation yeah man it's been interesting thanks for having me on and stuff as well I, lo- I love the chat yeah. uh, I like that you didn't shy away from some of the darker shit I was getting into <laughs> <laughs> it's important to talk about them man it's really important yeah. to talk about them well what a fantastic conversation it, it's really difficult to you know come off the back of that and and sort of sum it up really because it it jumped in many different directions and many different places but it was an incredible conversation and i just i just really hope that as a society we get to a point that we are all unique we are all different because being different is good and being unique is good but i just hope that in terms of like religion and sex and gender and ethnic ethnicity or religion that we just get to the point that we just appreciate people for being a people you know someone's a fantastic comedian for being a fantastic comedian someone's you know a brilliant actor for being a brilliant actor whether they're male or female you know someone's a fantastic doctor because they're a brilliant doctor they're a great intellect because they're just a great intellect you need to get away from this sort of like categorizing people in places and i know like for marketing and demographic and stuff we do use generalizations and stereotypes to place people in in ways that we can target them for like marketing and stuff but from a societal point of view you know he mentioned a bit about you know someone just booking people because they're a certain colour or booking people because they're a certain sex. It's great that these things are out there and their opportunities are out there, but it should just be a bill of fantastic comedians, whoever they are, whatever they've done in their life. They should just be there based on their merits and how good they are. So we just need to get to that point in in society and I, I really look forward to being in a world that's like that on a slightly lighter note you know just get it get on the website lukeantonycomedy.co.uk forward slash tco podcast and if you can donate that's fantastic anything you donate helps to contribute to this podcast follow me on twitter that's luke a comedian and follow me on facebook it's luke a comedian as well any of the details about preach sing about how you can follow him will all be in the show notes so please do follow him too For now, thank you so much for listening to this podcast and I'll see you soon.